Life is a journey. It has a beginning and it has an end. And through that journey, God will take you to and through many different places in your life. Although we'd love to stay on the mountaintops where it's pristine and perfect, we can't live there. You can't live on the top of a mountain. There's nothing there for you. But it does serve its purpose for a moment. So as you go from one mountaintop to the next throughout the journey of your life, you're going to go down through some valleys. You're going to maybe even end up in the desert, cross some rough waters. You're going to go through some different places. But God wants to use those places in your life not to define you, but to refine you. He's using it as a proving ground to make you better. So whatever place you're in right now, God wants to use that to perfect his purpose in you. Where are you right now? What place are you at in your life right now? This series has been amazing. I hope you've enjoyed it. The first week and throughout this entire series, we've been looking at different Bible characters and showing you how God used the places they were at to perfect his purpose in them. The first week we talked about my favorite Bible character of all time, Joseph, the dreamer. And we looked at how God took him from the pit to the palace and how God used those places to allow Joseph to trust God through trials. The next week, we ended up in the belly of a whale with Jonah, and we learned all about the impact of obedience versus disobedience. We had planned on doing a three-week series with places, but we feel like there's a few more places God wants to take us in this walk, and so we're going to extend it another couple weeks. I think we need to cover the mountaintop and probably the valley or the desert, so we're going to extend it a couple more weeks just because we feel like the Lord has a few more places he wants us to visit. Today, we're going to look at the life and the ministry of Peter and where God, the place that God called him to, to further his faith. It's going to be a really, really good service. And I want to tell you that it's not an accident. This almost becomes cliche, but it's so true. It's not an accident that you're sitting in the seat where you're sitting right now. God brought you to this seat so you could hear this word, because if you will grab hold of any one thing from this message, your life will never be the same again if you're ready and willing to receive it in your heart. So how many of you guys are ready this morning? Amen. We're going to further our faith. And speaking of faith, I have a little story that reminds me of faith, and I think you're going to enjoy it. It's about this West Texas rancher. All right. Now, the, he was an incredible man of God. He was a lot like Job because he was a rancher. He, he was a farmer. He had tons and tons and tons of livestock. I mean, this guy, he was loaded. Everybody say loaded. He was a really, really, really rich Texan with a lot of cattle and a lot of land and a lot of money and a beautiful, beautiful daughter. And at this point in time, he was having a coming out party for this daughter. It was time for her to just come out to life and just it just begin to move on and start a new season. She was becoming an adult. And his greatest desire as this father, as this great man of God, is he wanted to really kind of see who the, the, the most, uh, you know, the, the men of the, the young bachelors of East and West Texas, he wanted to know who had the greatest amount of faith. He wanted to see who the youngest, most incredible men of God were in that area because he was hoping maybe he could hook his daughter up with one of these guys. I know it's horrible, but he had this huge party at his big multi-million dollar mansion at his ranch, had all these guys, all these eligible bachelors from East and West Texas, invited them all out to his mansion and had this big luxurious party. It was awesome. And around about midnight, he had invited all these young men out to the back where he had an Olympic-sized swimming pool that he had had the foresight to stock with water moccasins. He wanted to know, according to Mark 16, talks about how, get this, you can take up a serpent, a poisonous snake, and it will not harm you. I don't encourage anybody to do that. But I'm just telling you that he really took this word to heart and he wanted to see if any of these, these men had enough faith to jump in and swim the length of this swimming pool full of water moccasins. How many of you guys would have done it? Not a hand in the house. I'm with you. I wouldn't have done it either. 
and he said, he said, I'm going to throw out this challenge because I just want to encourage your faith a little bit. If you're willing to jump in this pool and swim the length of it, I'm going to give you either a million dollars in cash. Changing your mind now? I'm going to give you a thousand acres of my best land, or I will give you the hand of my beautiful daughter in marriage. And all of you guys know that if you get her, one day you'll get all of this stuff. And no sooner were the words out of his mouth, but he heard a splash, followed by an almost immediate emergence at the other end of that pool. He ran down there with anticipation. He thought, this is a man of God. This is a man of faith. And he went and he slapped that boy on the back. I've never seen anybody swim so fast. You are pr practically running across the top of the water. What on earth motivated you to do so? He just sat there in silence. He's like, are you okay, young man? He said, well, well, let me ask you this. He said, do you want the million dollars in cash? The young man said, no, sir. He said, well, well, do you want the thousand acres of my prime cattle land? He said, no, sir. And he said, he said, darling, I think I got you one. I think I got you a winner, a great man of God with great faith. He said, then I've got to assume that you want the hand of my lovely daughter in marriage. And he said, no, sir. Well, for crying out loud, son, what is it you want? He said, I want to know who in the heck pushed me in the swimming pool. Because that ain't right. He was mad, but he was a man of faith, not because he wanted to be, but because he had to be right? Sometimes God is the one who kind of pushes us off. But today we're going to be talking about stepping out, not because anybody shoves you or gives you a push, but because you on your own accord and your own desire and your own faith step out onto the water. Immediately after this, after what? After Jesus had just fed the 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get into the boat and they crossed over the lake to the other side. While he sent the people home, after sending them home, he went up on a hill by himself to pray. I want you to note that. After Jesus had done everything that he did, he fed the 5,000 all day long. You know that he was absolutely, utterly exhausted. He didn't go take a nap, even though it was probably dusk. It was nighttime. He didn't go off by himself and just sleep. He went out and he prayed because Jesus knew this isn't even today's message, but Jesus knew that if you're going to be refreshed, it comes from getting in God's presence through prayer. Nighttime fell while he was there all alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting the heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once, and he said, Don't be afraid. Take courage, for I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you. So these guys were rough and tough dudes. And Peter was actually, him and his brother were the first two disciples that Jesus ever yelled to. And he said, Hey, come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. Forget the fish. You're going to have something way better than that to do with your life. And those boys, Simon Peter then was his name, and Andrew, they dropped their nets, the Bible says, and they took off to follow Jesus. Now, you may think, well, that's crazy. Is that like the first time they'd ever met him? It wasn't. They had been following John the Baptist's ministry, and he was the one going before and saying, the Messiah's going to come. And they were following his ministry. So when he came onto the scenes, these guys were like, yes, we'll drop it all to follow Jesus. And so as they begin to follow Jesus, they begin to see all kinds of miracles. They began to see, just like Brandy said, the feeding of the 5,000. They saw it. They saw the lame get up and walk. They saw the blind Jesus spit in a guy's eye and make mud and say, you're healed and watch him be able to see. They watched the dead be raised. These guys saw it all. They had watched Jesus do the most incredible miracles that we only read about. Okay, so they had some incredible faith. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, how many of you are awake at three o'clock in the morning? Only one or two. Not most of us. Most of us are sound asleep, but I want you to notice these boys are in the middle of the Sea of Galilee at three o'clock in the morning fighting the waves. Jesus came to them. 
Now, he didn't come on a boat. He didn't come by a ship. He didn't come by an airplane. The Bible says he came walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. Jesus must have thought they were crazy. He spoke to them at once and he said, don't be afraid. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to them once again. Here we go, okay? You're going to see Peter in action. This is Mr. Big Mouth himself. Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Now we're going to pause for just a minute. When you see that word if and you study it out in the original language, okay, when it was really written, that word actually means since. So read it the way that it truly should have been written as far as its context. It would say this. Then Peter called to him, Lord, since it's really you. Peter wasn't trying to question, are you God? Okay, he wasn't trying to say, if you're really the son of God, he was saying, since you are the son of God, here we go. He says to him, call me out to you. Tell me to come to you walking on the water. And Jesus says in verse 29, yes, come on. So Peter went over the side of the boat. He walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. He began to sink and he said, save me, Lord. Then Jesus immediately reached out his hand. He grabbed him up. And then he said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? The first thing I want you to note is that oftentimes in our life, the reason I wanted you to see what happened right before today's story is because a lot of times in our life, something awesome will happen. God will do some amazing work in your life. There will be this huge victory, and right after the victory will come a really big storm. You see, they had watched Jesus feed those 5,000 men, and as Brandy said, it wasn't just men. It was women and children. And I want you to just imagine, okay, this little boy, his mama, what a good mom, right? This little boy is like, mama, I'm going to go listen to Jesus today. I just imagine a kid this size, right? You guys are like, I'm going out. I'm going to hear Jesus all day teach. So mama packs up his little backpack, his little lunchbox, if you will. And she puts five little loaves of bread. And we're not talking the kind you buy at the grocery store that are pre-sliced. We're talking, these were probably small little loaves of bread she had done by hand. She packs them in there, and she takes two little fish, and she puts them in there as well. And I've been to Israel, boys and girls, and when you're in Israel, your fish, that's exactly what they look like on your plate. It's a fish. It comes. Eyeball staring you in the face, okay? So these weren't like filleted and fried up, exactly. and Mama had them in a Ziploc bag. Oftentimes, after you would see this incredible miracle, in your own life even, there will come a storm. And I bet if you think back in your life when something really awesome happened, follow it up and you'll notice that all of a sudden there was a storm or there was some stress. And that's what was happening right here, okay? So these guys, they're probably on cloud nine. They get into their boat and they start going across the Sea of Galilee, which we got to do. And that was awesome. Only we weren't in a storm. We were just on this beautiful boat and it was calm, but they were out there it was started storming, and the storms out there were fierce, okay? And I wanted to show you this picture because this, these kinds of boats were not huge ships like you would think about today. Brad and I actually even went to the museum, and we saw one. And, I mean, they honestly, the sides of them might have been two feet. And they're about and half, the length of this, down. half the length of the stage probably. Yeah, and then about they 20 feet dipped long. down kind of low. And so 12 guys, right, 12 fishermen are in this boat, and then the waves are doing this. So I can imagine that they were all just about to think they were going to die. When all of a sudden, they begin to look up, and who do they see coming? But Jesus. But they didn't know it was Jesus, okay? So they're completely freaked out. And what we want to talk to you today is about the fact that we oftentimes don't realize the opportunities that God is putting right in front of our face because of the places he allows us to be in, okay? So if you're taking notes, I want you to write these four things down. The first opportunity is this. Opportunities for growth come when we least expect it. That's good. These dudes were in the middle of the lake, Sea of Galilee. They honestly were fearing for their life. They were exhausted. I want you to think about this. If you got in the boat at dusk, okay, when all the people went home, they've probably been fighting this storm, trying to get back to land 
for hours. Now, mind you, they had they had been serving all day throughout the crowds so of people. So true. That's true. They serve 15,000 people probably all day on their feet. You, you want, want bread? bread? You want fish? They were probably utterly exhausted when the event was over. How many of you guys, when we have a big event and the event is over, you're ready to crash out, Wiped right? Out. Fourth yeah. of July, right? We feed all the people. We're exhausted. They fed 15,000 all day. That's three times the size of Grove. There you go. Three times the size of Grove. They were feeding them all day long. They were wiped out. Jesus tells them to get in the boat and head across the sea. And, you know, they're probably thinking, Jesus is so awesome. He's so sweet. He's telling us to get in the boat. You know, go go rest, boys. Just take a break. I'm going to go pray go and be refreshed. And what they don't know is that Jesus knows in his mind, I'm about to place them in a really cool opportunity. And he's probably on the mountainside praying for a while and then just watching them. I like the way you say that. You know what I mean? Just watching them. And all of a sudden, they're fighting the storm. So hours go by. They're exhausted. They're thinking they're going to die. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. The last thing they're looking for is a cool growth opportunity. They're not thinking about growing their faith. They're not thinking about anything other than, let's get off this water. We're sick of being on the water. Look at this. It says, again, at 3 o'clock in the morning, Jesus comes walking to him. When the disciples saw him, they were terrified and they thought it was a ghost. And that's amazing to me that they, they knew Jesus very well because they lived with Jesus. They saw him every single day. They went to bed at night and they, they saw him there. And when they got up, he was there. They ate with him three times a day. They were constantly with Jesus. If anybody knew who Jesus was and what he looked like, it was them, right? But it says that they didn't recognize him and they thought that he was a ghost. The point I want to bring out here is so powerful when you think about the fact that when you are in a storm, when you are in situations that are so challenging that you feel like your whole world is going to be crashing in, we tend to not even recognize that Jesus is right in front of us. And we don't even give attention to the fact that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. He promises us that he'll always be with us. He's always there. But it, it's, so, it's so interesting to me how it seems that whenever the storm rages and the waves come crashing in, we tend to forget that he even exists. But know that in those challenging times that God is closer to you than he's ever been before. But he's watching you. He's watching to see how you're going to respond to the situation. Now think about this too. How does Jesus come into the scene? He could have made his entrance so many different ways, but he chose to come in walking on water. Now when you look at Genesis, you look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Remember in the very beginning when God created everything, it says that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. That means that Jesus was there with God because he is God. He's part of the Godhead, and he helped create the water. When you look at Genesis, there, the, and a few verses down in verse uh, 26, it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Why is God an hour? Because he's three in one. The very thing that they thought was going to kill them, the waters, the waves, Jesus, who created the water, comes walking in on top of the water as if to defy it and say, water has no effect on me because I created it. And he's standing here in front of them, fulfilling his promise, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will defy everything that tries to defy you and tries to come against you in your life. He is full of power. And when you think about the fact that the one who created the waters is living inside of you, the same power that allowed him to conquer death in the grave is inside of you. The one who spoke existence into existence is inside of you. Then it doesn't matter what storm comes in your life. It doesn't matter what trials you go through. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It doesn't matter what your challenges are because God is with you. Why do we allow ourselves to get to that point of fear when greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world? 
And his word says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Do you realize it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter what happens. You can come up with any situation you want to come up with right now as an example. And I'll tell you right now, it does not matter. Because God has authority over it all. And if you are a child of God, you've been adopted by his grace. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You have nothing to fear. But fear needs to be diminished in your life. And faith is what cancels out that fear. The next point I want to bring out to you this morning is that God will give you the opportunities, but he is waiting on you to take the first step. Listen to this passage in 27. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid. He said, take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, since it's really you, tell me how to come to you. Tell me to come out to you walking on the water. And he says, yes, come. Think about this. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 6. I know I already mentioned this, but his promise is so clear and so true. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. That means that we don't operate by our feelings, but we operate by facts. When you see the storm raging in front of you, you get your eyes on it, you might feel like you're going to die. But the fact is that when God comes into your life, when you allow Jesus into your heart, he gives you life. And he gives it more abundantly. So don't pray for greater faith. Pray for the opportunities for faith to become greater in you. Pray for faith to be increased and become greater inside of you. Don't pray for God to give you patience. Pray for opportunities for patience to become greater inside of you. Don't pray to be stronger. God, make me stronger. Just let me, just let me be strong. Ask for the opportunity to become stronger. And God will give you all the opportunities you need because it really rests in you. That's right. I'll say, oh, say, I'll say, I'm going to speak another language. Okay, we're going to look back. Point number one, okay? I think if you're, you're speaking those, Cherokee or something. Is that Osio? I don't know. I've never <laughs> spoke that before. Opportunities for growth often come when we least suspect it. Point number two, God will give you opportunities, but he's waiting for you to take the first step. Just like Brad's joke, nobody's going to push you in. When Brad and I came here to plant this church, God gave us an opportunity to do something really awesome for him. He gave us an opportunity to do something bigger than we'd ever dreamed of doing. He gave us an opportunity, but it came down to, were we willing to take the first step? It, t- it took us stepping out. All right, point number three is this. New opportunities come with new challenges. Oh, my goodness. Do new opportunities come with new challenges? They always do. If you look back in verse 29, it says this. So Peter went over the side of the boat, and he walked on water towards Jesus. Now, if you just stop right there, you're like, dude, he's the man. He did it. He stepped out. He walked on water. He defied the water, too. But then if you read on, it says this. But when he saw the strong winds and the waves, he was terrified, and he began to sink. You see, what happened in that moment is he had the faith and the boldness to be like, I'm going out. I'm going to do what no man has ever done other than Jesus. I want to be so close to Jesus. I'm going to step right out and walk on water. And listen to me. We want to show you this picture because, again, this was not a calm little creek. It was not a lake that was just beautiful. It was in the middle of the dark night. It was raging waves. So he was stepping out on waves that were like crashing like this, okay? And so as he steps out onto the water, he did fine with his eyes on Jesus. But the second he caught a glimpse of those waves on either side, he started going down. The same thing happens in our life. We'll take a step of faith. We'll be bold and say, absolutely, God, I feel like you're telling me to go tell somebody about Jesus. And we walk right up to him, and then we get super scared. And we're like walking away, and the people are just like, whoa, that was weird. You know, or he asks us to do something. Man, step out and be a leader. And you step out, and then you're like, I can't lead anybody. You know, I, I quit. I can't do it. And he's asking us all the time to step out. But the second we start looking at everything around us, Maybe he says, hey, step out and start tithing. And you step out and you start tithing and all of a sudden the bills come in. And you're like, God, I can't tithe. Are you kidding? I got to have that 10%. I got to pay my bills. 
But yet God says, hey, if you'll have faith and just step out, you just watch what I'll do. I cannot tell you the amount of times we walked out to this mailbox right out here. One day we didn't have the money for the bills, and, and God had taught us a long time ago step out in faith in our tithing. I love that mailbox. I do. It's an awesome mailbox. It's an awesome mailbox. But one day we had we didn't have the money for the bills, you know, and I was kind of getting really frustrated because we'd given up our everything to come here. You know, and it's like, God, are you with us? You know, you told us to come here. We got four babies. We got bills to pay. Pastors should pay their bills. And so we're praying, and Brad's like, hey, let's just pray. Let's just have faith. And I'm like, have faith nothing. Where's the money, right? And so we pray, reel it back in. We pray. I go out that day to the mailbox, and that was a pretty common thing to do if we were broke, was just check the mailbox, because we knew God knew our address. I go out there one day, and I open the mailbox, and there's an envelope, no address, just $200 in cash. Who sends cash in the mail? Nobody, because you know that's stupid. You'll get it stolen, right? Not God. It came straight from heaven. Because why? Because we'd stepped out in faith, and he did that over and over and over and over. And that day, he was telling Peter, you know, he wasn't mad at Peter because Peter started to sink. He knew Peter was human. He knew he was flesh. He simply was saying, like, look, buddy, if you'd have more faith, dude, you can walk across this entire Sea of Galilee with an ease. You don't have to sink. But the second you start getting your eyes on everything around you, that's when you're going to start going down. All right, I want to show you this awesome illustration. When we talk about faith, we talk about the fact that if you're going to step out in faith, fear is the exact opposite of faith, okay? So I want you to imagine that this, in this jug of water, that this is faith. And your, your faith is filled up. You're to the brim. Whatever God asks you to do, you're going to step out and do it. But then you begin to look around, and, you know, you begin to talk to people, even some of your good friends right? And you begin to say, I think God's telling me to do this. And they're like, oh, really? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if you should do that or not. And people start breeding a little bit of fear into your life. And then you start thinking about it. And the enemy starts working on your brain. It's like, yeah, you know what? I can't go talk to people and tell them about Jesus. I can't, I can't step out and be a leader. I can't do the things God's asking me to do because it's just, it's too hard. And I want you to notice what happens as fear begins to enter your life. Faith and fear, they will not mix. Just like the water and the oil separates and what rises to the top? Fear. The fear. So you're sitting here, and man, you think, man, I'm full of faith. I'm full of faith. But you start putting just a little bit of fear, and it's going to rise to the top, and you're not going to be able to do anything that God is asking you to do because you're going to be so scared out of your mind. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you to be because he knows that the moment you start stepping out once, you're going to get a little stronger. You step out again, you're going to get a little stronger. I want you to know, and you're going to hear the end of the story with Peter in just a little bit, but his boldness really pays off. The fourth and final point today is once you step out, you won't be alone. Look at this part in verse 31. It says, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him when he fell into the water, right? He had taken his eyes off of Jesus and onto the circumstances, and he falls in the water, and he begins drowning miserably. But what does Jesus do? The word says, and you can circle that in your word, immediately he reached out and he grabbed him. And then he says to him, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? And what I think is so beautiful about this part of the passage is that Jesus doesn't just kick him while he's down. He doesn't say it serves you right. He doesn't pour salt on an open wound. He doesn't let them sit here and sweat it out for a minute. He immediately grabs hold of Peter's hand and he pulls him up out of the water. And isn't that exactly how Jesus is with us? No matter how many times we fall, no matter how many times we fail, no matter how many times we take our eyes off of him, he is so quick to immediately grab our hands and forgive us. He might slap us around a little bit and say, come on, you know better than that. Now, was he disappointed in Peter? Absolutely. And you want to know why he was disappointed in Peter in that, in that instance? Think about the great plans that Jesus may have had for Peter if he would have just walked out his faith. 
Imagine what Peter may have possibly missed out on because he allowed fear to rise to the top of his circumstances. Maybe Jesus would have allowed Peter to walk on water all night long until the morning. Maybe he would have allowed Peter to keep just walking on water down the shoreline all the way around the Sea of Galilee, waving at people as they got up out of their tents. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, guess what? Jesus really is God. Hey, guess what? He's alive. Who wants Jesus as your Savior? Come get baptized. Imagine what Jesus may have had planned if he only would have been obedient. And in your life, think about the times when you've taken your eyes off of Jesus and you put your eyes on your circumstances, you allowed fear to rise to the top, and God wasn't able to perfect his purpose in your life because you allowed fear into your heart. Think about the plans that God has for you. What things may you have possibly, maybe you've missed out on. I don't want that to keep you down, though. I want to encourage you this morning because you're saying, man, what a downer message. But I want to encourage you this morning that today is a brand new day. And the word says that, when, that, that today is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to look back and see the great things he's done. We're also going to see the, the areas and where we've messed up. And today is a brand new day, and we're going to make it better. Today is your day. God is calling you to step out in faith, to step out from your comfort zone, and he's calling you to walk on water. He's calling you to defy the laws of the universe with faith. He's calling you to do tremendous things today. But my question is, are you ready? So there's one of three people that you may be. And I want you to answer this question in your mind. Which one of these people are you? Are you number one? Are you the disciples that were in the boat watching? How many times do we look from a distance at people, maybe friends of ours, stepping out in faith and say, that's good for you, but that's not for me. I'm okay here on the boat where it's kind of dry. I'd rather die holding on to something, you know, kind of, kind of faith. They didn't have any faith. They were sitting there watching like, Peter, are you stupid? What are you doing? Or maybe you're Peter. Maybe right now in your life, maybe you're walking on water and you're thinking, this is pretty awesome. God told me to do something and I've stepped out and I'm being obedient to it and I'm walking on water right now. How awesome is that? What I would say to you this morning is don't take your eyes off Jesus. Don't get your eyes on your circumstances, but keep your eyes on God. Don't lose faith. Don't lose heart. Don't let fear rise to the top. Keep your eyes on Christ. Or maybe, maybe you've stepped out in faith, and maybe you got your eyes on your circumstances, and maybe you're in the water right now, and you are drowning miserably. Know this, that God is calling you with his outstretched arm to immediately pull you back up. So don't lose heart. But what did Peter do? Let's look at the scripture as the band comes this morning. So Peter went over the side of the boat, walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Then, then this is what he says. He says, save me, Lord. He shouted this from the top of his lungs. He said, save me help me. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you're saying, you know what? I stepped out in faith and I crashed and burned and I'm crying out to you, God, save me. And I don't, I don't mean just in your salvation with Christ. I mean, save me from my mess up. Clean up and help me. I'm telling you right now, he is willing and he is able to immediately grab your hand and pull you up out of your mess and help you back into the boat. You may have missed an opportunity. That's true. You may have missed an opportunity to be used mightily by God in that moment. But there will be more to come. I would give you this challenge because I, I don't know what God has been asking you to do. The water is different for everybody. Stepping out is different for everybody. Maybe God has been dealing with you lately just about stepping out and beginning to pay your tithe. Maybe God has been challenging you to step out and pray with your spouse, husbands. Maybe God has been challenging you to step out in something that he's never asked you to, uh, to do before and you're totally and completely terrified, just like the storm. What is it? 
What's he asking you to do? Maybe he's called you to witness to somebody at work and you just keep fighting the Holy Spirit. What is it? Whatever it is, I want to encourage you this morning. As you stand up, I want to encourage you to step out. I want to encourage you to step out and walk on the water. Jesus is standing right in front of you right now in your life. He has his hands out. And you know what he's saying to you? Sure, come on. I'm right here. Come on, step out. I created the water. I'm standing on it. I will lead you. I will walk beside you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Trust in me with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Because usually when you get in the water, you sink. And you drown. But don't lean on your own way of understanding things. Acknowledge me. Look at me. Focus on me in all of your ways. And I'll direct your path. Who knows what God has for you? Who knows what God may want to do with you in your, la- in your life at the place where you're at right now? Who knows what possibilities are available if you will only step out in your faith and let God lead you? What is he calling you to do? Are you willing to do it? Bow your heads with me this morning. For some of you, stepping out this morning may mean just admitting that you have sinned against God and that your relationship is out of order. Maybe you need to renew that relationship with Christ or maybe you've never had a relationship with Christ and you know that you need salvation. You want to make heaven your home. I'm going to encourage you to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save you from the inside out. I'm going to encourage you to confess Him as Lord and to never turn back to the old life again. I'm going to challenge you to dedicate your life from this moment forward to live for Him according to His Word, to surround yourself with godly people, to be in His house every time the doors are open, to inundate yourself with the glory and the power and the presence of Almighty God so you can discover life and never be the same again. If you want that this morning, and maybe if you're watching on video, and that's you, wherever you're at, I want to give you this invitation as well. All you have to do is admit that you've sinned, believe upon Jesus to save you, confess with your mouth that He is Lord, and dedicate from this moment forward, you're going to live for Him according to His Word. So if there's anyone in this house, and if you're watching by video, you want to make that decision, I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to raise your hand. And I'm going to pray with you right where you are. Are you ready? One, two, three. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for being obedient to the call and the drawing of God. Thank you for being honest with yourself. This is your time. This is your moment. I want to pray with you right now. Agree with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for your son, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. Wipe my slate clean. I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I confess with my mouth that there is none greater than him. I dedicate my life from this moment forward to live for him according to his word. With eyes closed, heads bowed, I want to commend you for being a new believer in Jesus Christ. The angels in heaven are rejoicing right now, having an amazing party on your behalf because this is the greatest decision you will ever make to spend eternity with God. No greater decision on earth. This is what you were made for. This is what you were wired for, for God's presence. Now, I want to talk to the rest of you this morning, and and you would say to yourself, you know, Pastor Brad, I feel like Jesus is calling me out to step out on the water in something specific this morning. And I want you to be honest with me and with yourself and with the Lord this morning. You know what that thing is. He's calling you, and he's saying, sure, come on. He's saying that to you right now. What is it? Maybe it's your tithe. Maybe it's praying with your spouse. Maybe it's praying with your kids. Maybe it's, it's witnessing to somebody. Maybe it's doing something so crazy and so outside the box. Whatever it is, are you ready to say yes and are you ready to step out? If that's you this morning 
and you are ready to step out in faith and do what God's calling you to do, I want you as a commitment to God to raise your hand right now and say, yes, Pastor Brad, yes, Lord, I am ready and I am willing to step out right now on the water, to step out in my faith. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I want to pray with you. And Misty wants to pray with you right now and agree with you in faith. Let's pray together. Go ahead, Misty. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you have called us for such a time as this, God, to step out on the water just like Peter. Yes. God, I pray, God, that the boldness that Peter had, God, would raise up inside of each one of us, God. And I pray whatever it is today that you have laid on our heart, God, I pray that we would be faithful to fulfill it until it's completed. God, I pray that no fear would take over. God, I pray that we keep our eyes upon you, Jesus. God, and I pray that we would be able to see the awesome thing that comes about because of our obedience. God, the growth, the refining process that God takes us through as we step out into this new place. God, we are so thankful, Lord. God, thank you for your presence. God, thank you for challenging us today, God, to grow in you and to step out. In Jesus' name we pray. They had transformation in their life, and that's what's happening in this church because, see, when Jesus touches you, there's a change. And praise God we're a part of that just by our giving. This morning we've got the text giving, so don't forget, if you've left your truck at home, that's no problem at all. Hold up your smartphones. I know you know how to work them. Text 918-223-8090. So this morning, if you are giving for the very first time, bless you and know this. God will meet every one of your needs according to the need.